till someone got in we're touch recording. with us. Really? Yes. Someone got in touch with us about the YouTubes, and they were sending us good advice, and I appreciate the good advice, but it was like, you really need to consider not swearing. And I was thinking, as soon as you start thinking about being natural, when you are actually being natural, it makes it incredibly unnatural. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know you mean. And do you know what? Part of the evolution of me doing this has been to try and swear less. Yeah. One, to swear less, and two, is talk less. When I, when I, you've run about Joe Rogan. When I, uh, when I started this, I, I think for uh, for a significant period of time, right at the start, maybe the first year even, was that I thought that I, I needed to voice an opinion on something that the guest was saying. If they said something, that I needed to do it, and that's what listeners would expect to hear or viewers would expect to watch. In reality, that's not the case. It's not. Like, very rarely, I'll only give an opinion on something if I feel really strongly about it or I feel like I've actually got something to add. Because a lot of the time, I was, doing, I was saying stuff, and it wasn't really adding value to the conversation. And also, people aren't listening, you know, the hardcore HR listeners, they ain't listening every time because they want to listen to me. They listen every time because they want to hear the, who the next interesting guest is. In oh, reality. Yeah. I, I'm swallowing my pride to say that. <laughs> <laughs> They're not well, coming back for me. <laughs> when, when's he coming in? <laughs> when you mentioned about coming on, I'd listen to some of your viewers, like your, your, your earlier guests. I was like, what the hell's he rigging me for? So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm honoured like, to be here myself, to be honest with you. Thank you. Guys, on. Welcome. Welcome to the studio, mate. Well, and in fact, thank you for the shelf and for the, and for the, and for the lamp. We Very nice. Bit, don't we? we do a bit. Help each other out. It's perfect, perfect addition. It is a perfect addition to the studio. Um, I will... In fact, people are listening and thinking, what the fuck's going on about? Go on Instagram. Up. By the time you listen to this, there'll be a picture of it up on Instagram. Gaz has done me a, a beautiful uh, shelf and brackets and uh, bespoke lamp made out of bourbon, uh, a bullet rye bourbon bottle. With it. What do you call that? An uh, Edison light bulb. Edison light bulb, like the old-fashioned kind of light bulbs. The, it's a modern light bulb, but it looks like the old-fashioned Edison-style bulbs, you know? Yeah. Um, but obviously it had to be bourbon rye. Why is that, Hugh? <laughs> The colour of the label? Oh, green. Yeah, green. <laughs> Fucking three pie. Yeah, very good. Very good. Pull that mic a bit closer to me. Cue for me. How's that? That's better. <clears throat> when you were talking like this, you're talking over here. <laughs> um, what were we talking about before the thing? Oh yeah, Joe, you want uh, Joe Rogan? So Joe was a uh, he was a comedian, and then well he is a comedian. He's also he was like a taekwondo flipping champion. He was a UFC commentator. And then obviously start the podcast just for shits and giggles, basically. So it's funny how you get you kind of learn about these other people, right? So I'd, the first time I'd heard of Joe Rogan, obviously he's, he's massive, but it was this um, inspirational talk that he did, you know, with the kind of the talks that they do with the music behind it gets you really upbeat, you know. And that's what I heard, and I thought oh, I like that. So I started googling who he was, and then yeah, I've listened to a couple of his shows now, and I quite like him, you know, um, like his shows. But then just chatting to you there, it was like, yeah, he's a, he's a comedian first. He did exist in, in another life, you know, before he was doing that. <laughs> well, he's still a comedian. Have you watched Is his have you no, watched I've his never, comedy? no, no, no. Mate, pretty, yeah, he's, he's awesome. I he's was kind of awesome. mixed up, mate, because I, I got the UFC kind of sort of background, but I wasn't sure if he was a fighter. Or, and then it was like, he's a comedian. I was like, what's going on here? And then it was, you know, not that that hasn't been done before. I think there's one of the brothers in America now. He's, he's went into boxing or UFC or something at the moment, isn't he? He's like a YouTube comedian or something i don't know what he said there's two of them there's brothers i kind of think of the name my kid watches them on tiktok all the time really bloody hell what's his name oh. Lo logan logan paul is it logan oh, paul jesus christ so there you go so my kid's 11 he thinks he's class <laughs> um but he's a boxer is he uh, well he was he was a in inverted commas a youtuber then he started boxing right he's not bad at boxing um he's not world class but he's doing he's a businessman yeah he's got a he's got a platform he can shout from he's being very antagonistic he's got talent as well in boxing, yeah, so, he back it up, yeah, yeah. so he can hold his own a certain you know with uh, with a certain level of opponent um and he's selling fights because he's got a following I think, is he going in with um mayweather next is he i've heard that i've heard that but i i don't know i Maybe if Mayweather sees his it's money, money in it. If Mayweather sees his money you made, then he'll do yeah. it. Yeah, you know, it's the only reason the, the McGregor fight happened. But Mayweather will win that. You know, Logan Paul's not going to beat Mayweather. How about let's get the viewers up on here? We'll start gobbling off about Mayweather. <laughs> 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 give, give a fight. I'll get chin made for a million quid. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 I fucking like it. Yeah, I don't know, mate. Getting hit by someone like that, you wouldn't come back from it, would you? I don't think that'd be. That's like take like a proper a proper punch from a professional boxer, mate. I don't I don't know if it'd be worth the risk. I don't know it's if a... you're unconditioned to it. If you've never boxed or sparred or so, I think he's so clinical in what he does. Right, he could be an anaesthetist because he could just put you to sleep and no further damage. I think I'd trust him. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, get you in there, mate. Rather you than me. Million quid. Yeah, rather set it up. Okay, now, how is um, how's uh, how's moth creature happening? Tell me where it came from. And you know, this isn't like a this isn't a, a bullshit question. Sometimes you know, um, talking about the early days, I'd feel like you when people come on who've got a, who've got something that they do like a business. I would feel obligated to ask certain questions because that's the done thing. And now, now 100 and what you this is number 134, right? It's like, no, fuck that. I'm, a, I'm actually interested. Moth Creature is a fucking cool brand. I think you'd be sitting here anyway if it wasn't. Plus, Dave Davis, who's a fucking cool dude, introduced me to you and, and Moth Creature. Um, and again, speaking off air, you've started it while you've got a while you've got a, a, a primary job going on, you're still serving, you know. How are you finding it? What's the journey like? Because I doubt it's been easy. And so, then the pandemic happened. <laughs> the pandemic, for me, I mean, we were speaking before, weren't we? The pandemic for me, I'm quite, I'm not a recluse, right? But I do love other people's company. I love other people's company. I love being around people. But I don't mind my own company. <laughs> I quite like my own company. So the pandemic for me was like just normal jogging. It was like, um, I don't go out anymore. Them days of me going out are long gone, you know? I might wear skinny jeans nowadays, but it's literally because I've got arthritis in my knees and I can pass them off as being like kind of skins, you know, the uh, orthopedic pair of pants. But moth creature for me, right, where did it come from? So basically I was going through some sort of tough times in my life, right? And whether this be real tough times or whether it be tough times that was just in my head and no, no one else seen, it doesn't matter. It's tough times like we all go through. And what I started doing was, this is going back some years now, before Moth Crochero was even an idea, um, I was on leave at the time. It was just following surgery. I just had surgery on my jaw. Head was flamed up like sort of bow selector, all loads of swelling, you know, and I was feeling a bit sorry for myself. And um, it was while I was on sick leave, um, the missus had got a piece of driftwood, um, literally just out walking the dog, found a piece of driftwood, and she says, um, she picked it up, she brought it back, and she says, I want a bottle opener for the kitchen wall. And I looked at it, and, and it was like, you know, like how brittle driftwood is. It's like cork. So I looked at it, and I thought, it's a pretty piece of wood, you know, but it's not going to work for this. Then when I went back to work, I got in with the metalsmith, right? I, I do like being hands-on with certain jobs. You know, I got in with the metalsmith. Jackie's name was, good lad. And he kind of taught us to weld. When I say weld, I say it like flippantly, because uh, <laughs> I'm a better grinder than a welder, right? But I can do it, you know, I can, but I wouldn't say I'm any good. But... I was in this metal shop and I got an off cut of piece of metal, put a piece of metal behind it, sort of drilled through it, tap dyed it, put my me metal mechanism at the top, put a little catch bucket at the bottom and that went up on the wall. And this was early on, this was a few years ago because I haven't been on social media long and I'd set up a, a sort of a, my own page on Instagram, Gaz Allen, and um, I put this picture up and a few friends that I used to serve with in Colchester, they sort of messaged and they were like, I really love that you should really do this you know you could do this and it kind of i took it as a compliment you know and then i went down the line of um i thought well we could do something but it needs to be something different to this it needs to be like a line of things that i could do like repeat orders kind of similar things you know so first of all i did like a vw thing because i'm i'm a vw nerd right i've got a camper van i've had for years and it's kind of my little sort of if, if I'm a bit sort of doom and gloom, that's my shell, like a snail shell. You know, I'll take my shell away and, and go and park up somewhere. Not getting up to no good, but just park up somewhere and have a moment. Anyway, um, I come up with this idea for a brand name, and it went back to the 1960s when the VW had come up with their bubble head, and it was like a Jetson-style bubble head thing. And I did my version with them leaning back, holding a bottle of beer in his hand. Shouldn't really be advertising a car manufacturer drinking, like, you know, it doesn't really work, but it worked for what I wanted to do. And I came up with this brand and iron thing and made it out of metal and then literally got like sort of one foot piece of wood, branded it with a blowtorch, you know, branded it with this little image, put a bottle opener on the top and a little catch can and sold quite a few. And then 
someone made us aware of like copyright and stuff like this. So I started panicking. I was thinking like I wasn't making a lot of money. VW, I wasn't like worried that VW were going to drag us through the courts and that, you know, because I'd made like 30 quid on eBay. Um, but I came up with the Pegasus. Obviously, it's not my image, but I thought this will work. And it wasn't really to make money. It was literally the sort of, I came up with two versions. One was for Tom's, like blokes that are skinned and quite want something cool. And then one's for Rupert's, right, which was a bit more upper class, you know, I suppose. And because uh, I've got more disposable income. And the small wood one was a Brandon um, image of the Pegasus, right, which I blowtorch it, put Brandon in on, come up with this cool thing. Sold them for like 15 quid. Literally take us all weekend to make it. <laughs> probably probably cost us 15 quid in wood. And um, But then the other version, which was I had some blanks of the uh, Pegasus steel. I polished them, had some mahogany of um, old deck boards. Everything was like reused, reclaimed, resal like salvaged. Uh, but it was proper mahogany. And um, I put magnets in from the front, like literally countersunk them, put this steel image of the uh, Pegasus on, which I polished, polished the mechanism at the top, the bottle opener. And they sold for quite good money, like sort of 80, 90 quid. Yeah. And um, but this is where I kind of worked out that me putting a price on things is not real life. Because people will pay for what they want. And just because I wouldn't pay that amount of money for it, that's because I would have the skill set to make that. And that's not saying that these other people don't. But you kind of limit. You put a price on what you think you're worth and what your products are worth. And that's the wrong thing to do. Because when we do that, we, we put that sort of confide, I suppose, or that upper limit on it based on what our friends would buy. And you can't really bid like that because the world's massive. There's people out there that don't know what Gaz Allen makes, you know what I mean? And they might have more money and they like what I do. So you kind of need to price it fairly and not be too harsh with your pricing. But it was doing these. Sorry, go on, Hugh. Are you, su are you suggesting that, you, that people generally underprice? I think people are For forced to underprice to make money. Generally. Otherwise, I think... Because the market is so ferocious. I think with handmade goods, people are forced to underprice what they're doing. So th there's a model that you look at, right? You've got to look at how much your, your components are, right, first and foremost. How much is your time, right? Don't be ridiculous with your time, how much it's worth. Like, So I even went for like a sort of bog standard, what's it, like £8.50 an hour or something, like, you know, minimum wage. And, and you know, how, are you, how old are you, Hugh? 39. 39, right. So you're just a couple of years younger than me, but you'll remember your first jobs. Mate, when I was at school, I was working for £1.25 an hour. So £8.50 an hour is a gift, mate. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm up for that. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm not knocking people that are surviving on that because it would be surviving nowadays because the cost of living is so ridiculous. But £8.50 an hour, I can put £8.50 an hour on what I'm doing, plus me components. But then this is the key bit. You have to put on. So if you've got a business and you want to put money into your business, you have to work out. So see your studio here. How much would your studio cost you to run on a daily rate? And that's what you have to work out. So then you work out, right, so this bottle opener, for example, might take two hours of your time. You might work an eight-hour working day. And in that eight hours, you need to bring in, what, 100 quid. So straight away, you know that that's two, um, two hours. So that's 20 quid you need to put on that bottle opener straight away. Then there's the two hours, which is your £8.50, what's that, 17 quid. So there's 37 quid before you've even done components. Your components might be another fiver. No one's going to buy a bottle opener, mate, for 40 quid. <laughs> They're not going to do it. So you're forced to price your things down just to sell it. But I wasn't doing it as a, a sort of a business. I was doing it because I genuinely enjoyed doing it. And this is kind of the foundation of what Moff Couture was, if you like, before, again, before Moff Couture existed as an idea. But I had this thought, right? So on these days when I'd be pure down in the dumps, and, and it's easy to remain in that mindset. It's, it's hard to shift out that mindset. You can cope and you can, you can do the activities or the tasks that you set for that day. But there's always this fog at the back of your mind, you know, which is like just unhappiness. And it's because of whatever's causing you to be there. So typically I'd finish work, right? And I'd go back to my room in the mess because I was living away from the family. And during the week I'd be living in the mess. And I'd just switch Netflix on. And I'd literally gorge on box sets. And that was my way of kind of forgetting the shit that was making us upset, upset, you know, unhappy. And it was great when I was watching it because it meant that I could totally switch off. My brain would just give us some rest. And what would happen is when the end credits would start rolling on this, right, I, they'd almost be like anxiety levels would be raising because what would happen is the volume in my head, like all the, the sort of things that would make us unhappy would start coming back. 
you know what I mean? My mind was like sort of getting back in the room. Now, with doing the bottle openers, it's just doing something, doing something physical with your hands, right? Like creative. That serves a similar purpose to just watching Netflix. Like, i.e., you can zone out and just concentrate on what you're doing. So if you're chopping a piece of wood, you can totally be concentrating on the chopping that piece of wood. You're shaping it, you're sanding it. You're just totally concentrating on what that is, which means that all that other stuff just zones out. It just quietens. Now, at the end of it, once you've made this thing, I mean, we're not talking rocket science here. None of it's like kind of, you know, <laughs> groundbreaking stuff. I'm not like sort of Elon making like sort of rocket ships and stuff, you know. Um, I'm making like wooden bottle openers. <laughs> Let's be honest with you, you know. But but at the end of it, you've finished it. And, and what it's done is, because you've done something creative, it's kind of... It has built your confidence up in some areas, maybe it's that you've neglected some areas that you've forgotten about. And what that does is, it doesn't deal with the root cause of what was making you unhappy, but it does grow your confidence in other areas. So it does put a spring back in your step. So then when you've got to go back into an environment where these, for me, it was just not getting on with some people. And that's life. Everyone has that, you know. Um, so I'm going to dwell on it. But that was what put me in these places, right? But when I was back in them, environments, working environments, with these people that were making us feel sad, I kind of was less bothered. I didn't have as much, uh, as much anxiety facing them on a daily basis, you know what I mean? Because I felt good about myself, and whatever they were saying about us, and nine times out of ten, it's never to you, is it? It's always round the rumour mill, you know, so it's behind your back. Um, it kind of didn't matter, because I thought, well, I know me worth, and other people know me worth. So it doesn't matter what they think, not really. And I'm don't even, and this is the key bit, you become less bothered about trying to prove them wrong. And, and as soon as you can do that, as soon as you can sort of, well, I'm not bothered about trying to convince you, you think what you think, it's, it's a shame, but it is what it is. And, and so when that happens, you, you kind of get a bit more peace with yourself. Um, so it was that whole creative sort of loop, like being creative, that sort of, it, it made me think more positively and it helped me deal with negativity. And then, so when Moth Couture came around, I'd had some friends that liked what I was doing. And they said, guys, it's you that you need to sell. It's, it's you. And, excuse me. <coughs> I genuinely thought it was a bit self-indulgent. Um, I thought it was, like David Beckham, right? These global, iconic, sort of superstars. They can have a brand named after themselves. <laughs> they are that brand. Is a just a bloke, just a normal geezer. It's a bit vain or self-indulgent, and, and really it's not. But I think I've heard this phrase recently, right? In, in imposter syndrome. I think a lot of people in the military do downplay themselves and their um, abilities because we do believe in being humble blokes. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? So when it came to doing anything like creative making stuff to sell I didn't think I could put my name on it what I thought was I wanted to put some other attachment I know people like to attach something to something so I wanted to come up with a brand name and a logo and that's where Moff Couture come from and even that has its own story but I'll take a breath and let you speak I suppose <laughs> no it's like mate it's really interesting what you're saying um the the when you were talking about something Oh, sorry, the positive impact that switching your mind off would have, yeah, like binge binge watching or doing something other than doing something to take your mind away from it, right? Whatever, whatever that it is, it's really interesting. It's like a, you're absolutely right. It's a holistic approach to everything, especially with mental, like you do with physical health. Same with mental health. You know, you approach your physical health. You look at what you put in your body. You look at your alcohol consumption. You look at what what different types of training you're doing. You look at the rest you get in all of it it's the same on the mental health side and a lot of the a lot of the times people can't identify what is the issue that's causing the issue or they can't change what's causing the issue in your example people 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 making your life a misery right in other people's example like uh they haven't worked two jobs they can't so they're working two jobs they hardly get any sleep well they probably can't change that because their financial situation immediately but you can offset it by looking at, by looking at all the other Im things that impact your mental health and focusing on those you can you know, stuff. You can increase stuff. I mean, while you were talking, I was thinking an analogy in my head and how to put it into words. And a poor analogy, but sort of maybe not. Is you know, 
the wheel, the spokes in the wheel. You get a spoke that comes loose, starts getting looser and looser and looser and looser, and it's not very good to hold the wheel up. You got to look at all the other spokes, make sure they're in good working order, focus on them, tighten them up, make sure they're good to go until you're able to get round to sorting that spoke out, or it rectifies itself. Wouldn't happen to the bike. Here's a poor analogy, but you see my point. So, yeah. all, uh, and if you don't focus on the whole thing, every single spoke together, focus on the ones that are in good nick and the ones that aren't, then the wheel comes off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I'm not going to use that analogy again. But it's <laughs> no, it's really interesting, mate. Um, I think the key there, what you said, sometimes you can't put your finger on it, right? Sometimes you can. So probably, like, to be crude, right? And just <laughs> be mindful about what we were just chatting about, about um, what one of my sort of supporters on the YouTube saying, you know, maybe oh, don't yeah. swear as much, right? But, but one of my crude examples is this, like, you can take sort of immediate action about something that you recognise in yourself. So for a period of time, when I was learning about sort of the, the power of social media, if you like, and, and sort of also the, the dangerous slippery slope of social media, right, where I'm not going to score points here like with people, but it is what it is. Uh, so social media can be used for vanity, right, or it can be used for business, right? Now, when I was doing these bottle openers, for example, before I move on to the moth creature of it, so I called it um, artisan bottle openers, right? And it was cool, and I was making these things, and then it become like, you know, I, I probably had about 300 people following it, which was good. I was chuffed with that, I really was. And, and the sort of interaction on it was kind of decent, like percentage wise. I didn't have a clue about social media, I just, oh, here's a picture, you know, like, no write ups, no nothing, right? It was just, here's a picture. No hashtags, no abusing, like, sort of, or trying to get ahead of algorithms and often, which is now all, you know, I went through a stage of like, it, it ruined my life, you know, <laughs> I was like, ah, I need to get this right. and. Fuck it, it is what it is, isn't it? If people like it, they like it. If they yeah. don't see it, that's the shame. If people would like it and they're not getting to view it, because it's just because of the way these algorithms work, they don't push it out because it's not a popular post, whatever. Um, it is what it is. You know, I, I'd love to have the money to go and. It's awful, this, right? Go and pay some fit young lass to go and sort of advertise my products. Because, but then what that's doing is I might get a load of likes on my thing. But they're not really liking my product. They're just liking it, like a, a bonny young lass, like presenting it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but it, but coming back to your point, it's a way of getting it, getting exposure for your brand. So a percentage of those people who like the bonny young lass, yeah, are gonna like the product. But as that's well. and that's because you understand how the algorithms work. So more people like it, which presents it more. So hopefully one day someone that does like the product will say it. But what I was doing with my artisan bottle openers. I'd kind of adapt, you know, you, you hear Warren Buffett and that go on about like have multiple streams and stuff and it's great when you've got money to put into different things. But if you ain't got money to put into different things, you've got to be a bit more inventive and create these other streams. So I started doing cheese boards, artisan cheese boards. And it was like, God almighty, and it was like literally a piece of wood, nice shaped, you know, and, and branded, you know, and, and I'd sell them, you know, sell some. It was decent. And then there'd be the Christmas giveaways, you know, and you could like win a chopping board with knives and with cheese and stuff. And it was good. And it was all about, like you say, it's less to do with how much money you're getting in the immediate value of it. It's more about how it's adding value to your brand by sort of getting it out there more so more people know about it. And But then as I was watching Instagram, I was watching what was popular on Instagram and I was watching and a lot of what was popular on Instagram was the fitness industry. And more specifically, probably less to do with the fitness industry and more to do with the fit people in the fitness industry. And at the time, I'm not there now, and this is where I was going to come back to, you can do corrective action when you address what's wrong. But at the time, I got into my fitness, and I was really into my fitness. I was never like sort of mint nick or nothing, you know, but I was in, probably in the best nick I've ever been in. And I had a goal. My goal was my 40th birthday. I didn't want to have a body like a dinner lady for my 40th birthday, right? So I was working hard, and I got up to work in two sessions a day. Thir like six o'clock in the morning, half five, six in the morning, I was doing skipping, 30 minutes skipping with crunches. This was Monday to Friday, and then on a night I was doing weights, and I really got into a routine. I was doing this for about a year and a half, and I loved it. I loved it. It didn't take over my life. It meant I didn't go on the, the source during the week, but I wasn't bothered about that. I was more interested in how I felt good from doing the fitness. And on a weekend, I'd live. You know, I'd, I'd eat all the junk. I'd drink all the, the, the beer. You know, I'd, I'd do that because you... People talk about like, your lizard brain and stuff, you know, and controlling it. You, you can't. You've got to give into it because it's part of who you are. And if you, you know, if you, if you don't allow yourself to indulge once in a while, what will happen is you'll just go off the rails. You'll just go bonkers. That's my thought on it. So you've got to allow yourself sort of these treats. People talk about treat day and all this sort of stuff. 
if it's a treat weekend, it's a treat weekend, but you get back on track on the Monday, you know? So I started putting pictures up of me in the gym. <laughs> and then I started putting pictures up without the tops on and stuff, you know, because I was in good nick. And the following went up to like some berserk, like sort of two and a half thousand. And the likes started going up a lot. But it wasn't, it didn't relate to sales in my bottle openers. People weren't interested in my bottle openers anymore, you know. So what had actually happened was I'd evolved my artisan bottle openers page to my own personal vanity page because it made us feel good when all these people were liking it. So what started out as a very genuine sort of journey, it, it kind of evolved into this thing. Where it became like me mirror, mirror on the wall. It was telling us how good it was, you know, and telling us how good, oh yeah, I'm getting reassurance from this. But what that did, it had a detrimental effect to other aspects of my life. Like so, so my missus, Trudy, she, she didn't like it. She didn't like it because I was, well, I'd become this pure vain bloke that I never was. And it kind of like, right, okay, so you have negotiations, you know, you need to, something needs to calm down in your life. So I did, I, I calmed that area of my life down, you know, and, um, but I learned a valuable lesson with social media there, right, I did. And I, and I love social media, I do. I, I definitely see how it can be used positively. It's, it's not social media's fault when people use it negatively. It's just the way that people manipulate stuff, you know? Social media as a tool is fantastic. Um, but it made us think about what it was I wanted to achieve from social media down the line. So when Moth Couture was able to launch, it was right. I, I ain't going to be looking for just likes. People need to like what I'm, what I'm putting out there. And if they like what I'm putting out there, that's great. And if I have five people following us, but I've got five people liking it, that's amazing. That's better than having 10,000 following and have like sort of 100 like because the percentage for me is just wrong and I'd rather have a, a hardcore of people that like what I'm doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, mate, that's fascinating what you're saying there about um, about going off the, going off track and it became your own personal vanity project. Really interesting. I've not, you know, I've not thought about that scenario before. Really interesting. And come to think of it, there uh, well how many how many brands in inverted commas are, are people out there that it is just a vanity project it is purely a vanity project and that's what they're doing that's what they got and 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 that's what they that's what's driving them but what is it giving them in in terms of value in their real life you know what what i mean what value can be having five thousand ten thousand however many flipping thousands of millions of followers on whatever platform if you're not able to, in reality, if you're not able to monetize it, or if you're not able to turn it into doing something else that is of other value to you that isn't money, you know, charitable work, for example, or um, or giving exposure to other other whatever. I, I don't know. You, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. Yeah. I wonder how many people are expending a lot of energy, and all it is is a vanity project. And this was to to go back to what we were talking about before, literally just before when I was on about this, uh, you know, hiring a young fit blonde lass or something, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. No, no, you said that not, there's nothing wrong with it. No, right? no, no, I didn't. It's just because of my interpretation of social media now, right? There's nothing wrong with that at all. There's not. Um, but what I'm getting at is when I was starting out with Moff Couture and I did want to grow my audience because it was still important to us to grow um, quickly. I couldn't afford to pay for marketing. So it was like, right, how am I going to do this? So I looked at all these other options on social media. There's these follow loops and all this sort of stuff. And I tried them all. And, and basically you follow people in like, like, so a lot of you look at your, your social media following. You, so Moth Couture brand, for example, right? I make stuff. I, I, I haven't found my niche yet because I make a lot of stuff. I literally make what I think's cool. And if people like it, that's great. And if they don't, that's fine. I get that, you know, it's it's an acquired I don't even think it's an acquired taste if they don't like it I don't know what's going on in their heads because <laughs> I make some yeah, class you're fucking idiots. <laughs> but no no but my point is um, what I I don't just limit myself to there's some fantastic shapers out there that make surfboards amazing right got a mint talent but and this is my point I don't think their their talent stops after they leave their workshop at just making surfboards I think they'll be class at other things to do likewise I think someone that Writes music. I think they've got other aspects in their life that they're creative in. If someone, and basically this goes back to, God Almighty, you know, you know how I mentioned before, like, absolute hero of mine was Billy Connolly, right? And he had this amazing ability to hold an audience, but not just that, he'd, he'd captivate them because he'd have a point, right? This is my story, A to B. But to get to B, you'd go everywhere around every number, every like the bloody encryption, the Enigma code. You know, I'd go through every letter, but he'd always have a way to come back onto track, right? 
Now, I'm the complete opposite in that, in that I can do that, but I just can't find my way back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, right, what was your point, guys? I've listened for three hours. <laughs> but so I've got this theory, right, that, and especially it helps with having, I've got a, a sort of, she's not even a toddler yet, she's like sort of um, seven month, eight month. But when I watch Seren discover stuff for her first time, right, th this is reverse engineering it, this is putting context to what I already thought. So my son's got um, ADHD. I'm incredibly proud of Hayden, I really am. Um, and he's also been diagnosed as like um, high functioning autism. He's super bright. The, the, the authorities, the, you know, the medical, the, the education, they kept saying for years, that, nah, nah, there's, you know, we, we, we see summit there, we see summit, but there's nothing, like, you know, and, and it was like, and we were asked why it was important for us to sort of get this sort of recognition, I suppose, of Hayden, you know, off the, the medical profession. And it wasn't getting a label or a, a, a sort of recognition. It was, and this, this is my theory. As a kid, we, we have this creative sort of, it's just natural. To be creative is natural. It, it, and to explore and to discover and to, to learn ourselves, you know, teach ourselves. Because everything's brand new to her. And as you get older, you get taught stuff, and that's great being taught, because it's like a quicker way of learning, right? You, you're getting showed like a quicker way of learning, which is brilliant. And it, it's a time-saving device, you know? But what that does is it kind of restricts our own creative urges. It, it kind of like puts a... Because we become less reliant on it, because we're getting told how to do stuff, we're getting showed how to do stuff. And then as we get older, like you go into school, you get showed how to do stuff, and, you know, we get taught how to be a worker we get taught how to be an employee we get taught structure we get taught this that and the other and that's great it's set me up for a life of always working which, which is the sadly where we're at in the world you know i've got this romantic idea about that's not how the world should be but that's just not life we understand that life means that unfortunately we're going to get on this hamster wheel and we're going to keep on working because we've got to pay the bills you can't have this freedom unless you can pay the bills you know pay the bills and then you can have the freedom to enjoy life well you know it's like it's balancing act isn't it you've got to get both things right now Hayden when he was a toddler right I was um I didn't meet Hayden until he was 10 days old I was busy on a course with work in the army and he was 10 days old when I met him and there's things like that there's things like that are unavoidable but ultimately you could have made I was on a course at the time I could have wrapped I could have come off this course and been there for Trudy at the time could have been there for watching Hayden being born but in my head I justified it by thinking now if I pass this course I can offer them a better life in the future more money coming in so you kind of justify things but it doesn't mean you don't regret certain things you can't go back in time though so there's no it's not being flippant it's not being tongue-in-cheek about stuff but there's no point in dwelling about what you can't change so you just gotta move on make sure you don't do that again you know you, you can avoid it because it makes you feel bad so at the time i went to afghan as well um there's always ways out of things in the military but basically i've been told i was going and i went and um and i loved it i know this sounds bonkers you know and it was the reason why i joined the army you know to do what i was doing out there i came back and uh i had like a week's r and r the flights were delayed i think there was something going on with um dust clouds or something over Iceland or something. So it delayed oh, all the yeah, flights. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? All our flights were shipping out expats from their sort of tax-free holders and that. <laughs> you know, the lifestyle. So we ended up sitting in Afghan for like sort of a week of two weeks leave. And it was, it can't be all bad though. We sat drinking with a Dutch or something every night, you know, but it is what it is. You'd sooner be home in your sort of like sort of shorts and t-shirts in the summer rather than sat in your uniform. And um, but I come home and it was amazing just being with Trudy and Hayden at the time. It was honestly, it was amazing. And even just thinking back now, it was how special it was. But this is where we we become like these pushy parents because Hayden, he wasn't, he didn't want to crawl as a baby. I'm really going into detail here, like, and I'm sorry about this, but we'll carry on. He he didn't want to crawl. He'd he'd lie on his he'd lie on his front. You know, do you remember when you were doing your, your your jumps course and you'd see these guys doing like sort of free fall training? They'd be on like a tool trolley and they'd be like sort of doing this in the in, on the floor. Hayden would do that. He just wouldn't get the whole dynamic of crawling. He'd just lie on his belly and move his arms and legs. <laughs> and uh, he wouldn't move forward or backwards. In fact, he did start moving backwards, right? And um, But my whole time on leave, I literally picked him up and like walked him around, hold his hands. And he was getting it. He really was getting it. It was strengthening his legs. He had the strength in his legs. He was using them. And then 
Trudy bought him a walker, and literally a week of me being back in Afghan, we did a Skype call, and uh, she said he walked. He walked, unaided from one city, well, two cities at the time, like 90 degrees sort of thing, but the space between them. He walked from one, he climbed up, walked from that one, like a drunken sailor, you know, like all over the shop, to Trudy at the other one. He only walked like a metre. But when she realised what he did, she like, ah, let out a yelp, and he dropped to the floors if he'd done something wrong. So then from then on, she was always right ready with her phone to video him. And she did video him, and he looked like this drunken sailor. And it was amazing. And we were so chuffed. We were, it was like bragging rights, you know, like seven-month-old, he's walking. Does it mean anything? Like, now? No, it doesn't mean nothing, mate. And, and actually, looking at Hayden's progression, you know, looking at things m more deeply with Seren, and, and, and sort of looking into the ADHDs and the, the sort of autism things, I worked out that... The, the crawling is such an important part of a, a, a baby's development, right? Because it, it's the first thing they learn about, like, sort of um, drive or focus or keeping at something. What do they call it? Determination, you know. It's the first time they learn to be determined and, and keep on attacking it until you get, you know, until you get it yourself. And we, we, we robbed Hayden of that because we were so keen for him to walk, so we helped them walk. So when it comes to Sarah this time around, and... and you know, me and Trudy had spoke about this, and I was like, we're not going to help her walk. It's not because we're being mean. We're, we're, we're literally not going to. We'll, we'll encourage her. I've got arthritis in my knees, man. They're in clip. I've had two surgeries on my left. I'm due a third. I'm due one on my right. But you forget all that, and you forget the pain that you're in when you're crawling around with your kid, and you're looking at your kid and smiling, and your kid's like not just trying to figure out what's going on. But I'm crawling around trying to encourage her to crawl, you know, and then copy us. Not forcing her to, not pushing her to. But she learned it herself. She started crawling. And now she's all over the shop, mate. She's chasing... The, we've got a little chihuahua. She's like 13-year-old. I don't know how she's still kicking, mate. She's like so old, but she's so sprightly, you know. Shit's everywhere. Like, but, you know, you can't, you can't have everything, can you? And um, But, yeah, she's like sort of aggravates the dog now. So the dog will, like, tap around the house, you know, and, like, on a little tap toes. And, um, but Seren's, like, chasing her around, crawling around, like, zoom, like zooming around the house. It's class. But the, the point of what I'm getting at is I've really looked deeply it's sort of key things in, in sort of me, me baby's development so then if I'm doing that with me baby and I'm looking at how she's learning new things for the first time I'm thinking to myself well this 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 backs up my thought process about us being creative I do believe every single person has this creative ability it's just what happens is we get institutionalized with school with college, with university. We get told, now this is the way to do stuff. All right? And you accept that this is the way to do stuff, when really that's not the case. This is why we've got phrases like, think outside the box. <laughs> People that think inside the box don't change shit. People that think outside the box, they're not thinking outside the box, they're thinking outside the box that the institutions put upon people to think. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? It's so kind of, what I did with my own creativity, none of it's groundbreaking stuff. It's just going back to doing stuff that I've not been taught. I haven't been taught to do nothing, mate. I haven't. As, as a kid, like, um, single parent, I'd watch my mum do pretty much everything in the house, you know, until she, you know, she passed on when I was a young lad. Um, but my grandparents, my granddad was always hands-on, but he died when I was really young. Um, my dad's side, um, sort of my granddad was... <laughs> would go and see my dad, like, every random hit and miss weekends, you know, we'd see him every weekend for like a sort of two months or something and then we wouldn't see him for about five years <laughs> and then he'd turn up at the door, you know, and be like, how are you doing? And we, you know, mixed emotions as a sort of seven, eight year old kid, you're like excited but you're also incredibly confused, you know, and and, and this would have been tough for my mum to see because she sees like what's going on but and it would probably hurt her when she sees the excitement in our face of seeing him and this and the other but not slating the old man he is, you know, uh, but we then go and spend Saturdays at his parents' house. And his parents, my grandma and grandma, they weren't like religious nuts, but they were like strong Catholic sort of family, you know, and big family and that, you know, and they go to church every Sunday and stuff, you know. And we'd either sit, and this is the madness of it, this is your recollection of childhood. We'd either sit in the main house, like it wasn't the main house, like it was some manor or something. We'd sit in the house, like in the kitchen or the sitting room, where well, grandma would force feed me and my brother cod liver oil on a spoon and say, what the hell are you doing, man? Like, you're ruining with an eight-year-old. We, we don't want cod liver oil, but she'd give her cod liver oil to make sure we're getting vitamins. Oh, cheers for doing your bit. And, um, and then she'd talk about religion and stuff. Or 
my granda would be in his little shack outhouse, which was a little lean-to. It was tiny, honestly tiny. It was like a quarter of the size of like the, the space here, you know, in my workshop, you know, tiny little place. But we'll go in, he'd have bare minimum woodwork. You know, remember old-fashioned woodworking tools? And there'd be sawdust everywhere, and, and I don't even know what he made. He just used to like going in there, so he didn't have to drink cod liver all himself or talk religion. <laughs> so I'd go in there, and I'd just, he wouldn't teach us anything. I'd just stand and watch as a kid, seven, eight-year-old. And so I don't know where this like sort of ability to do stuff comes from. It's just I've got this ability to try. If I'm looking at a pergola at the moment, right? And for I don't know if it'll ever come off. I don't know if I'll be living in this house long or if it, whatever happens in life. But this oak pergola I want it'll probably cost ten grand to get workers in to do. But the materials will cost about a grand. What is it? Uh, a pergola, you know, like a sort of. <laughs> You see them on like holiday, didn't you? Like uh, people have got them in the back gardens now, like sort of just a, a wood structure, like a wood frame, with like wood slats going over it. It's oh, not yeah. a full roof. People put creeper plants over them and stuff. Excuse me. <coughs> but I'm looking at putting like this oak pergola down the side of my garage with a couple of swinging seats. Just what I fancy doing, like you know, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I haven't seen it anywhere. It's just in my head. And um, but it'll cost a lot of money to get someone to do this who knows what they're doing. And to me, it'll cost about a grand for materials. Still a hell of a lot of money. But I'd rather, if I can do it and get it right, I've saved nine grand. If I do it and get it wrong, I maybe just have to buy the material again, and it's maybe cost two grand, so I've still saved eight grand. If I do it and I get it wrong three times, right, ultimately my point is I'll never stop until I get it right. And then what I've done is I've saved X amount of money on getting a proper person to do it. Excuse me. And I've become that proper person because I know exactly how to do it. But to my standard and my standard is you see when I was like putting that shelf up mate there's a level of OCD <laughs> that just won't quit do you know it's horrible mate but it, I use it to my advantage because it means we will eventually get there but we're not sure where I come from but even doing my garments like screen printing stuff right when I've used uh, different people to, to do that for us because I don't have a, um, a sweatshop I don't have like this big company you know I'd, I'd love to that's an aspiration you know that you I have this you have to have a sweatshop I'd, lo I'd love to be <laughs> in a sweatshop. <laughs> Do you, you know what I mean? I don't have um, a sort of my own stu design place, right? Like, and teams of people doing stuff for us. And, and not a lot of people do. You know, even big, massive brands will go to other people to make stuff for them, right? And it's just as you're a smaller person doing it, like a smaller company or what have you, it becomes a lot more expensive because you can't buy the volume what other people are doing. So... I've shopped around and went with a few companies. I'm not going to name names and that. That's not what I'm in the business of. But some of them have let us down big time. And what they've said is when, when the prints come back and it's been wonky or the label's been bloody sewn off center and stuff, and they're like, you're being too finicky. Your customers won't be this finicky. And I'm like, but it's my brand. It's my foot forward. Slag me off, mate. Slag Gaz Allen off. He's a dickhead him, right? I can cope with that now. I've had enough years of it. But don't slag off Moff Couture. And I don't want to give anyone that um, excuse to do that, so I'll never do that. I'll always put the best foot forward. Y you know, you ask about the gift wrapping and stuff when I come in, do I do that with everything? I do. Because, like, when you go to shops like All Saints or somewhere, I want people to feel that special feeling when they've spent half their wage on a t shirt that's going to wash terribly and hang awful afterwards, right? But they'll buy them because they like the brand, they like the association, they like, the, like how they feel when they go in and they're spending money on a premium product. And the last of the lad behind the counter is wrapping it up in create paper and you know, and you walk out with it and you feel good about yourself. And that's what I want people to feel when they get my stuff. So they get it and it's every part of that sort of um passy the parcel moment you're enjoying. The, you know? the, the best brands have that, I think. You, you in that the focus isn't just on the product, it's on it's on the experience of from the moment that arrives in the post or the moment they handed it over. I mean, as an example, which I've just realised, which is backing up your point, what, so on the shelf, you've got the shelf which you made for me, the brackets which you made for me, right? You've got the lamp which you made for me, and what else have I put on the fucking shelf? What's... Oh, the box, the yeah, box. The box, I put yeah, the yeah. fucking <laughs> box on the shelf, mate, because I love He's the box. Art. I put All the, the box on the shelf. It's not going to stay there, because I'm going to need to move it for the stuff, but I didn't put the, the box on the floor. I just realised as you're talking, I put the box on the fucking shelf. Because it's, it's fucking cool. I like it in the cardboard box that it came in. You know what I mean? As, as, you know, it's a test of what we're saying. But to, to what you're doing, what you're saying. But it, it, you, you, you absolutely validate the point. And that's not to say everyone should have the fucking meticulous standards for everything. But in, the standards they mean, need to be in line what you think your customers expect of you. In what you do, you're talking about craft. 
you, you know, ha um, even though you're not making the t-shirts yourself, for example, people expect a level of detail from a shelf, from, from a lamp, whatever you're selling them, a fucking bottle opener. And if, it don't, if that isn't replicated across every product you provide, then it's an indication of a lack of quality in the business. Someone sees a t-shirt of Moth Creature, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the logo's off slightly because that's what you've allowed, they're going to expect the same out of the stuff you're making yourself, which isn't the case. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good lesson in business. So, so what, <laughs> what, what was said back to us, and this is, this is where... This is where Gaz loses friends, <laughs> because what was said back to us was, um, you know, some big brands, they, they're not as being as finicky as what you are, and I'm like, right, okay. I went, but big brands can afford to knock off a big percentage of what their order is, because they can put things in TK Maxx, because people still want to buy into their brands. Like, I, I shop in TK Maxx, that's why I buy my jeans, mate, I'm not going to pay... I remember this ridiculous moment where I was nearly going to part with about 400 quid as a, a sort of early 20-year-old on a pair of on-dutch jeans, mate, because footballers were wearing them. And it was like, oh, wear man. I just, I, I, I'm glad I saw sense at the end of the day. But I used to love fashion, like, you know, sort of, it, was, it wasn't even, it was never ridiculous. It was never Vivian Westwood. It wasn't catwalk fashion or nothing. It was like really super, super beyond the high street, right? It was beyond the high street. So it was like high street fashion, but beyond the high street price, right? So it was like, yeah, if I spend all my wage that month on that pair of jeans, I'm happy. <laughs> is a single bloke, is it mean I'm going to pull in the nightclub having this particular bed? No, it's not. But it makes me feel good about myself, and that goes back to the fitness thing. It, it made me feel good doing that fitness. Do you know what I mean? But as you get older and your priorities change because you realise, you know, the romantic sort of vision of the world isn't quite so, and you do have to pay the man to, to have that element of freedom then you realise, well, I can't afford to be buying this pair of jeans if I've got to do this bill and this bill. And then you just get accustomed to that, don't you? And then the bills are just part of life, you just accept it. So your bills are all paid, and then whatever money's left, you know, as you get even older, older, I'd say, well, I've got a bit of money left, so I might invest. Like, I'm not talking about any crazy investments or nothing, but I'm talking about even savings or putting your money into something, right? Rather than just, well, I've got some free money, let's go down the pub. And as a young lad, that's your kind of, because it's all about having your social circle around you. Um, as you become older, you become more comfortable without that support network, that social circle, which is all still very important, but you just don't need it every day. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I had people in these uh, businesses that were doing me t-shirts saying, you know, do this, that, and the other. And I'm like, I can't put my stuff into TK Maxx, mate. You go to TK Maxx and you see a Moff Couture top, you're like, fuck's that like? <laughs> I'm not paying that much. And it might be a discounted rate, but you say, I'm not paying that. I don't know what the hell that is. Um, so it's kind of like I had to be really almost, <laughs> I'll say words and you pick us up on them, you had to be anal with stuff, <laughs> you did, you had, I had to be over the top with stuff, and you know, I'm working with a new team of people now, and I hope that that works, I hope it works out, because I, I don't want to be shopping around for, it's like if you take a car to a garage, you know, and, and some garages are really good, and some garages aren't, and, and it takes a while till you find one that you can trust, and, you, and when you do, you never leave them, you know, and, and so you have that loyalty, but you know what you're getting from them as well, so, anyway, we'll come back on track there. Eh? Where, where Moff Creature come from, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the track. Go on. So, right, no, no, this is one of my little garden paths, right? And so, <laughs> so Moff Creature, right, what was important for me was, before it was even a brand to sell this stuff, right, what I wanted to do was share how... How it was being creative and making these bottle openers, how that made me feel. I wanted to share that. And so it was, yes, I wanted to sell me products and stuff, but I wasn't making any money from selling these products. You know, they were so cheap. So it was like, right, okay, so it was about sharing this. So I, I, what I did was I came up with this moth analogy. And, and I came up with it because I thought, I didn't laugh, it might be corny, but... So if you imagine a moth, right? I'm, I'm no David Attenborough neither, so I don't quote us on facts here, right? <laughs> it's just what was going on in my head. <laughs> but imagine a moth, right? A moth spends most of its days as a caterpillar, right? On the floor. <coughs> and all the time, it has the sun above it. Everything, life, you know, comes from this sun, right? This is in my head. I'm not an Aztec neither, but this is what, what goes on in my head. So this caterpillar is looking up at this um, sort of sun. And then eventually, at some point in its life, it'll go into this, um, what did they call it? It was, a, it was a cocoon, but they call it something else, don't they? I forget what they call some it. Some kind of pod, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, a a, a pup, 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 pupus? Pup. 
Poo piss or something like that. Some, something, yeah. Um, on, I'll have a look. Go, keep have talking. A, yeah, have a go. Yeah. So it's, it's like something like this, like a chrysalis or whatever. But uh, I think you're right with P. It begins with something like that. But they go into this thing for however many, you know, whatever period of time is, uh, whatever epoch. And then eventually it'll break out of it and it'll become this moth. It's completely changed, right? Now, take that as a sort of idea. Go back to what I was saying before about kids, right? We each grow into ourselves at different rates. My Hayden, right? My Seren, me. We each grow into ourselves at different rates. And some kids, I say kids, I'm not patronizing, like your Steve Jobs or your um, sort of your, um, Zuckerbergs of the world, you know, they get it from the off. They know from the start what they want, right? They're driven. Now, some of us, we don't get that until we're sort of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Hopefully, in a lifetime, people will get it and they'll get what they want. They'll get what their purpose is. And what purpose will change, right? And, you know, what's your purpose now, Hugh, doing this, might change in 10 years, five years, two years, one year. My purpose, what I'm doing with Moff Couture, might change. But at this moment in time, purpose brings meaning to a life. It sort of gives with direction, the direction that the military gives you direction, right? It's just not your direction. It's the direction you're told to follow. And the moment you discover your own direction, it's, it's liberating. It's, it really is. It's, it's, it's something to invest your own passion in. That's how I feel. I feel so strongly about what I'm doing. And if people laugh and people think it's this, that, and the other, well, 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 that's your thing, you know. And if your thing, if your purpose is laughing at other people, being happy and, and looking at it, well, that's, you know, your existence. But mine for me at the moment was Moff Couture and sharing how being creative could be a positive effect on your life. So going back to this moth, right, it, it's now flying, right? And this, this thing evolves, right? This idea evolves. Pupa. Pu is that what it's called? P-U-P-A or also uh, chrysalis. Yeah, pupa P though. P-U-P-A. P-U-P-A. Yeah. Chrysalis, yeah. Oh, that's good. Kind of cool. I pulled that from a memory. I wasn't Googling it off camera while you were talking. At all. No. You're one of them blokes <laughs> in the pub quiz, aren't you? No, I wasn't, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> you're not winning the Pringles this year, no. <laughs> but any, So with this idea of this moth, right, so we've already got that bit tick, right, almost like it's not a box tick and exercise, but yeah, I get that, how it relates to everyone growing into themselves at the same rate. And, and no one's right, no one's wrong. But... The moth now, it's got an amount of time left and it, in its life, the version it's going to be. It's grew into itself and it's got an amount of time left. And the moth already knows what it wants. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to go for this light source, whether it be a candle, whether it be a light, whether it's not going to fly at the sun, is it, Christ? But a light source and, and it attacks that. And that, that light source for this moth becomes, it becomes either its problem source or it becomes its sort of focus but whatever it is, it, it becomes this unwavering kind of focus that nothing else matters. Everything else is just drowned, or, drowned out around it. And it's attacking it. It's, it's like sort of, it's, it's overwhelmed it. It's took over it. You know what I mean? Are you getting the idea? <laughs> so, and that's like us with a problem, like us as humans. So when we have a problem, right, we fixate on it. And that absolutely drowns out anything else going on around it. So you could have, excuse me, <clears throat> we talk about social media. You could, in brands before, you could have, um, say, a hundred positive comments, right, on, on a particular post or an image that you've put up there, right? Something you're proud of. And you could have one person that puts something negative up. And that negative mightn't even be real. It mightn't even be true. It might just be that bloke was pissed or he just, he didn't like the attention you were getting and he wasn't. So he just wanted to put something up there, right? And, or it's just whatever. It doesn't even matter. But what happens is, because we're all human, you end up overanalyzing what that what were you getting at? Well, you know, you, you don't have the conversation, but in your head you're thinking, oh, why the hell? You know, and, and you become so it is disillusioned because you you forget about all the people that are championing what you're doing, you know. So so that's like the moth with the light. It forgets about everything else and just focus on this. Now, if you turn on an ambient light, stay with us, <laughs> stay with us this example. Turn on an ambient light. So in this room, you've now got the, the light with the moth. Turn on an ambient light. That ambient light lights up the rest of the room. You'll see that round that one light where the moth is. There might be a hundred moths, and they're all attacking that one same light. But without the ambient light on, it was just darkness. All they can see is that light source. They can't see the um, the, the um, other moths around it, right? So this, to me, made sense in my head, right? So us with a problem, right? We might be suffering in silence with this problem, and and largely the reason we'll suffer in silence, right, is because of it's it's not a, it's. 
it's not whinging about society, but really the way society is, we don't want to burden people with this problem. I know we all talk about sharing and stuff, and yes, we do, and, but we've all had their moments when you've tried to ring someone and the person's not answered. And it's not deliberate. The person's not answered because they've got their own life. It's not any malice against you. It's just that's a fact of life. Sometimes you'll ring someone and they're not answering. Um, but we have their moments where we think we can't talk to someone about the problem. We don't want to be judged, right, because we can't cope. Because everyone around we it's like the Lego movie. Everyone's singing and dancing. Everything's awesome. So everyone seems like great in their lanes. So why am I struggling in mine? So you don't want to share it because you don't want people to judge you about you can't handle your load. You know what I mean? Does that mean? So, so then you don't share it. But actually what might be happening is every bloke around you, lad and lass around you, might be suffering with that same problem. And we're all just suffering in silence. When really if we just shared it, and this is the message that's been coming out over the past few years about mental health, sharing, right? And, and it's, it is true. It's not jumping on bandwagons and stuff. And I hate the fact that people think that people are jumping on bad wagons. There might be some people out there having angle with stuff, but ultimately the message is the same, you know, and, and so it's always about like sort of encouraging people to speak up and share rather than suffering in silence. And if that message is the same, regardless of whether it's for someone's angle or whether it's not, it doesn't matter because the message is the same and it's a good message. So I thought, right, well, I want to create a community on Facebook. Oh, it, it, Facebook was the vehicle because no other platform would allow us to create a group. So I created a group on Facebook called, and I called it the Moth Cratura Community Group, right? We'll come on to like, the sort of the Cratura bit in a second, but I called this group the Moth Cratura Community Group. So we're happy with the moth. We, we know why it's called the moth. Um, but this group, I wanted it to be a place for, yes, initially for me to share my own creative ideas and kind of positive affirmations with people, but I wanted it to become this um, sort of self like, like all of artificial intelligence almost, you know, I wanted it to become its own life. Like, so people would actually interact on there without me having to sort of kick them up the arse to do that. And so the Cratura bit come in because it was like, uh, right, you, you know, you'll have your brands that you kind of like. And um, I do like brands like, um, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, Dewey X Machina, right? And um, What are they called? Dewey X Machina. How do you spell that? Oh God, this is where you're quizzing me on like a simple four-letter word. Yeah, X machine. I think it's do you, D U E S or D E U S. Oh, D I yeah. Do you know who corrected me on this? Gaz, oh. Gaz, Gaz corrected me on this. It's Did D, it? It's Dias, I think. Dias. I pronounced it as juice. Juice. D U D E U S. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's Dias. So these. Or Dias. Oh fuck this! <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think it's DS, mate. It right. is. It's yeah. to you what it is, right? And and it's to me what it is. And the thing is, right? I don't speak Latin, so I ain't got a clue, to be honest with you. But I do like the Latin, right? I can't Latin dance. I can't do none of that stuff, right? And but I like the um, I like the sound of it. I'm not a religious person, but I do understand that it has a biblical uh, sort of meaning uh, or origin. Excuse me. It's all them coffee, so I'm, I'm pure burping away here, like, with brews. But I like the sound of it, and so I thought, right, okay, I want to do something that sounds cool. I thought it would be cool. Now, being creative had to have a place in my brand name. It couldn't just be Moth. Um, it had to have something in there, but it, it couldn't be Moth Creative or something. That didn't sound right. It did. Literally, I went on to Google Translate, <laughs> horrendous cop-out, and I typed in creative, Latin, and it came up with Crutura. And I was like, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> <laughs> so I come up with this Cratura, and I, and I loved it, because in my head I thought, Cratura sounds kind of cool. Moth Cratura, Moth Cratura. Yeah, yeah, I'll say it over a couple of times more in my head and reassure myself. So I come up with this thing. And then I went down, and I was so excited, right? And, but you've got to keep it to yourself, because I was going down this route of, right, I come up with a drawing. I drew loads in my sketchbook, right? Of, how do I want this to appear? How do I want it to look? I love uh, skulls. I think anyone that likes sort of any sort of pop culture likes skulls. You know, whether you're a rocker, whether you're a roller, everyone likes skulls. And um, I had a conversation with someone, um, you know, quite high up in a particular brand that does a lot for uh, helping veterans and, and, and mental health and physical health and well-being. And they actually give us some good advice, but they said, um, they said I shouldn't go with skulls. It's a bit too dark, a bit too like gothic, you know, a bit too, like, sort of, uh, you know, especially if you're relating it to mental health and stuff, of which it's not. I'm a mental health advocate, but I'm certainly not a mental health sort of organisation, you know, that's not what Moth Couture is. It's just, I've shared my story about how it come about, you know. 
Um, but he said it shouldn't be like that. And I said, well, in all fairness, I mean, I said this, and then literally a couple of months later, I think it was World Mental Health Day, and people were selling T-shirts with rainbows on, because I literally said, well, I don't want to start a brand with freaking rainbows on. That's just not real. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but he was like, no, no, but and I says, right, okay. I mean, even look at your bottle there. What, what's that? Uh, 81 power drink. It's got a skull on it? Yeah. What's not cool about a skull? Oh, I agree do, with you. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> so I was like, right, but... So I come up with a death hawk moth, right? And in one wing, it's my own version, com completely unique. Um, I know a lot of people do death hawk moths because they are cool. Why, why aren't they cool? I mean, what was his name? Uh, Buffalo Bill. He made them so cool on the telly, didn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Buffalo Bill, Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was Buffalo Bill with that, wasn't it? It was Hannibal Lecter who, just, who gave up the clues. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Buffalo Bill. Yeah, I mean, he was a bit of a devil, but... <laughs> You know, he liked his moths, and the moths were pretty cool. Um, the rest of the stuff wasn't too coarse. I like wearing people. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not going to go down that route. But I come up with this creature in its wing, right? And then I was like, right, well, I need a way of writing it in a word. So I come up with my own font, right, just writing this out, and, and kind of went with that. But this moth creature community group, uh, even now, I, I'm strict with it. I don't even advertise my own brand. So this is where we split off in between being what I'm trying to share the positive effects of being creative to Moth Couture, a brand where I'm trying to sell my products. So, and this is the way that I try and like, sort of explain it. Moth Couture is me selling my creativity to the world. Moth Couture, a community group, which is smaller, but I mean, it's still like sort of, sort of 1,500 people or something involved in it, you know. But what happens, like most things, you'll get your sort of hardcore, your nucleus of people that will interact, and then you'll get a lot of people that don't. And, and as a sort of, Someone that admins a site, that can be quite, um, it can just be a, a bit of a, an unsure sort of, it can give you an un, unsettling feel because you're not sure if all the people are seeing your posts, right? Or if just some of the people are seeing the posts because they've liked it in the past, so they'll see the future posts kind of thing. This is a group. Now, really, in a group, everyone should see it. But the fact is, some people have left it and... When I was clearing from a recent unit um, um, in the military, I was clearing from a unit, and, and when I was clearing my mess account, um, the lass in the mess, uh, the mess manager, she said, she says, oh, you know, we'll be in touch, best luck in the future, and I was like, yeah, cool. I says, well, you're part of the group, aren't you? You know, you'll see posts from time to time, and then she says, well, I left. And I went, oh, did you? All right. It's interesting for me to learn why. Like, why did you leave? Because, Hugh, I'm, I'm over the top. Um, there's plenty of groups on Facebook that will allow, you know, risky sort of humor and bants. That's not my group, mate. My group's about kind of trying to share creative stuff. So, so like, people share pictures of them doing gardening. Honestly, it's so diverse. Decking, um, tree houses, um, their artwork, drawings, everything. It's mint. People skating and stuff like this. It's like, and it's so diverse, I suppose, um, how much how creative people are and my point is like um like so i like vws and i like surfing and i like parachuting and i like all this stuff but there isn't like a one group on facebook that covers all these things but what there is is there might be a vw group and you'll get like splinter conversations about <coughs> surfing or splinter conversations about wild camping or splinter conversations about something else and that's great but it has in, in business and in everything else that we do in life, because of this way that we're sort of indoctrinated into sort of thinking inside of a box, we compartmentalize everything. So I wanted to I wanted to throw that away and create a group where this is about creativity. And you share your creative sort of exploits on here, you know. So share what you do. And, and it, someone else mightn't do that, but it might inspire them to try it. So if you do paddle boarding, share that. You know, and, and if that... Ins it, inspires one person to give it a try well that's great that, that's good that you've got someone off their chair to try something new you know that's good you've added value to someone's life it's just it's a hard sell because it's so broad a spectrum being creative and it's it's still an evolution now it's you know it's it's not finished people ask where where you know, what does moth creature do it's like I can't summarize it. It's not like this thing where I can just put a word on it, you know, or a sentence. Oh, this is what we do. This is what we do. It's not, it's not Pepsi Max, the taste of a new generation. It's not none of this stuff. You know what I mean? It hasn't got like a sort of specific thing because it's broad. Ultimately, it's me, Moth Couture brand, making what I think is cool and selling that to whoever buys it. And Moth Couture community is me 
trying to offer a sort of platform or a space for people to share their own creative ideas. Does it, yeah. Yeah, but that's not two different things you're doing there. That's a that's a you got a what you got a what you do, which is you you make and you sell products, and you got a why you do it, which so, is the which is what the community is. But so that's yeah. the why. Why you do it because you find value in being creative, and that's you know that's why people, that's why being creative is a positive experience in whatever way, shape, or form because it demonstrates value to yourself. No one else it demonstrates value to yourself in in you doing whatever you want to do. An example. Um, just on that, you know, I, I completely agree with what you say, 100. percent I got a mate in in, in Swansea, going through um, and has been for a long time going through real, you know, again as we all do, going through a real, 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 real tough time. And he's recently, he hasn't, I don't think he's like done any painting or drawing since he was in school. And he's, is it a tiny bit younger than me? I think or he's about my age anyway. Everyone's about my age. yeah. We're all around. What's a year or two apart from each other when you're, when you're our age? Like, so he's about my age, right? But he's now started painting, and he fucking loves it. That's like, amazing. And he's the last person would have thought would start painting. It's like he just and he started doing it, and he loves it. He, well, and you know, what, I want to. I, I he, he he's painted a piece, and my old man's got into buying artwork right recently, paintings ran from from galleries, and I'm trying to get him to. And he's no Van Gogh, mate. The, the simple fact that he has painted that, and I know why he's painted it, because he gets value from it. It gives him something. He's doing that purely for his own, his own gain, as in the painting of it. He's not painting to sell to people, but I want to buy it. The one, first one he's done, I want to buy it off him, because, because of what's behind it. Exactly. I know exactly why he's done it. And that's what art is to a lot of people, because art, it means mm. something to someone. So there'll be some art you look at, and you'll be like, well, that's classically i can understand that it's proportional it's this that and the other and it's, but it's the art that means something that's more powerful because what you see in a piece of art is different to what i see in a piece of art and, and to every other person and and this is this is why like sort of anything creative is so special <laughs> did you hear us though but yeah, 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 yeah. right just voice over at the end that's just right, it right off like that. that's fine. but so but to go to finish what I was on about there with that mess manager, I'm sharing stuff on this community group when people don't. So if there's a lull, right? Could you imagine what this would be like if you got me on here and I just sat here like this? Well, <laughs> you'd be like, <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck are you oh, doing? Wait, you're a clown or what? Like, <laughs> what are you doing here? So you try and create, and, and this is, again, I'm just honest. I'm not being mean, I'm just honest, but some people will find this cutting, right? Get back home the night and they'll be like, a thousand people have left this group. <laughs> but if I'd have created a, a, a group on social media about an inanimate object, a GSXR 600, right? I'd have a high percentage of people who would passionately gob off on there about this GSXR 600 because they've got one and they know the best. And I'm not knocking them because they know what they know. But you invite people to talk about themselves, to share themselves. No, nah. it's, it's this. So, so what do I do? So I just, do I just let it be like that? And it just becomes another one of these groups on social media that people are part of, but it's just like another one of these groups. Or do I have to try and stir that up? Do I have to try and share something on there to get people to interact? So what I do is, if there's nothing for a while, I'll share. I don't advertise. I don't advertise my products, but I'll share something on there about what I'm doing or something creative or more futura. And then what that'll do is it'll kick up a little humdrum again. So it'll be some likes, it'll be some interactions, and then someone else will share something, which is the key. That's what I want. People sharing their own stuff on there. And likeliness is, Hugh, a lot of these people on there will never buy Moff Creature stuff. And that's not what this was about. This was about inspiring people. So if they feel inspired by it, that's great. Would it help if they let us know that they were by just commenting? Yeah, of course it would. But it's not going to stop us doing what I'm doing by them not interacting because they might be, they might be so intimidated or shy that they're not going to interact, right? But what, she, what this last said, she says, I had to leave the group. And I goes, all right, why? And she went, don't take this the wrong way. I went, I won't, go on. She went, it just seemed a bit me, me, me. <laughs> and in my head, I like laughed. And, and I said, I went, what do you mean? And she went, well, you know, it's a lot about you, isn't it? I went... You don't know that, like, I started that group, and, like, if no one sends anything, I'm going to put something on there. But it is what I deem as still being, like, sort of creative. It's not just randomness. 
And she went, no, no, I know that, I know that. I went, she went, I hope I haven't offended you. I went, you haven't, you haven't offended us. And the thing is, right, I, I value you, you telling us it's good, honest feedback. I went, I'll be honest with you, and this is not to be mean, I wish you'd have said something. Or I wish you'd have shared something. Because in my head, I didn't say this to you, but in my head, I think, right, if you're going to be the critic at the side of the boxing ring, gobbing off about how you should do stuff, you need to get yourself in that ring from time to time. You can't not have a valuable opinion. You can, of course you can, but this is just the way my mind works. You can't criticise someone else's efforts, right, if you're not going to be willing to get in there yourself. So what I would like to, for her to have done, or anyone else, if you don't like the way a group's heading, but you're part of that group, speak up, share something. Uh, Go on. Yeah, or leave. Well, that's it, what it, she it did do. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not the her. Yeah. You know, that's the other way of looking at it. It's a, <laughs> taking it, you know, I know I know what you're saying, but it's just two sides. It's not for her. Yeah. So her leaving is not a bad thing because not, she's not the kind of person that is, is that you feel the community should be or interact, you know, or get involved. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I see your point. But that whole, man, community building so hard, you know, and I think on on it especially where you've got where it's not your, your it's not your revenue it's not your revenue stream right it's an auxiliary to it it's a you know it's a growth mechanism and so and and plus community a community needs to grow organically you know you, if you try and force it it ain't it ain't gonna happen and and the, way I, the reason I say that is because that says to me that you shouldn't, if, you, if you're if you starting to, oh, and I'm talking about myself here because I think about it a lot, yeah, yeah. especially with the podcast, right, is um, for the same reasons. The, there's a community going on, uh, interaction going on that, that is outside of listening or watching the podcast and commenting on this. Then there's interaction going on in some other way. Then there's pos they're gaining something positive from it. The people who listen or watch this, they are getting something positive from the podcast in another way, right, which is probably the same way you think about it, right? Um, and also on the on the business side, it attracts more people to the brand in a different avenue. But if it's if it's got to grow organically, and if you try and force your hand for, force it to try and grow in non organic ways, if, if you like, then it it, it almost going to stifle the growth, or or you're going to put too much energy into it, emotional energy into it, because you start stressing about. Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? Why isn't it growing? What am I doing wrong? Da -da 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 -da. Then that's going to take focus and energy away from what the real thing is, which is create for Roth Creature and sell. I'm not telling you how to. Do, I'm no, not no, I I'm agree. You I agree. A different perspective on it. Um, well, you said, uh, however, it sounds like you've already you've got that perspective now. No, no, no. Yeah. I totally agree. But the thing is, and, and this is, um, we all learn at different rates, don't we? So. It just happens that, genuinely, when I did this, I started that group first. Now, fast forward. So we started this group. I say we. I'm not talking about me and me, myself, and Irene. But I say we. I just I don't know why we say we. But um, pardon me. Was it just you? I, oh, yeah, it's just me, mate. <laughs> I'm your Todd. Liking me on post. <laughs> but so I always say we. And I always, even when I'm sort of messaging people about Math Creature, I always call it our Math Creature. You know, because I... If they follow it or they like it, it's them. They're part of it. Do you know what I mean? This is so. I always say we, right? Stupid man. <laughs> it's not stupid. It's, it's make you think of it as a community, you know, and, and yeah. that's what it is. And so, so anyway, and plus, it take, it goes back to it. Also, goes back to the the staying away from that vanity thing. It, you know, it's that this isn't mine. Well, it is, but I don't want to call it mine because it's a bit self-indulgent. Mm. It's the same way in certain ways with a podcast in certain scenarios. So you and yeah, exactly? everyone knows it's yeah. you, right? But your brand, you know, H hour, but everyone knows it's you. Yeah, but it's not, though. And it's the same way uh, Moth Creature uh, is exactly, not. Because no, what you're makes H right. hour H hour yeah. is everyone behind it. Yeah. It would be fuck all if it was just me and the talking here and there was no one else getting any experience from it, positive or negative, in whatever way, shape or form. It would cease to exist. Yeah. So it is. It is like the, what's the word? The royal, the, the royal way, the royal light. It's, 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 uh, it's fuck all without your followers, right? Well, exactly. Because that's what breeds the life into it, you know. Otherwise, it, or breeds the life into it. But it's what they, it's exactly what they get from it. So whilst it is you and I here sitting chatting now, right? There's no one else here. 
but you know the value that that's bringing for people that do listen, right? And that's kind of what I'm doing with what I'm doing with Moff Couture. It is me gobbing off in my workshop, right, <laughs> from time to time. And I had this, don't get us wrong, I've got ideas of grandeur, right, where this moth creature is going. So, and this is what brings us back. It's like, we talk about investors. I mentioned Warren Buffett earlier on, right? I'm, I'm learning business at the moment. I'm, not, I'm reading business, right? I'm going back to an institution. I'm learning business at university, you know? Um, you do resettlement at the end of the forces, don't you? And you're resettling in an area, right? And... and I was passionate that I wanted to resettle in something that I was interested in. I've got these crazy ideas. If you even joined in the, the reserves when I leave the army, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, head of defense and the head of the military, but no, you're not using us anymore. But, and the reason was, and it wasn't even to join the reserves doing what I do, like in my sort of normal job, that would be good money. If to join the Remy as a Tom, be an old man Tom, but as a metalsmith, so I can learn how to weld and fabricate formally for free, right? The military is a fantastic job center of opportunity, right? If you understand what it is you want to get out of it. It's not a one-way thing. You, you know, there's return required, but you can get a lot out of it. You know, so there's a lot of positives to take away from the military. As much as I'm at the vinegar strokes of my career, <laughs> you know, uh, with probably a little bit of uh, sort of, you know, bruised ego perhaps. We'll just call it that and move on. But so when I talk about resettlement, I wanted to do something that was going to aid me in what I'm doing. Now, I'm so passionate about Moff Couture, and this might not work. You know, it might be like sort of next year, I'm, I'm on the door, and it's not working. It's not going to happen, because I won't, I'm not that precious where I won't lift my hand to another job. You know, if I'm stacking shelves in the supermarket, then that's what I'm doing. I don't think I will be. That's not cockiness, or it's just a belief in myself. But I certainly don't want to go into any sort of... Um, job where I'm, my reward's minuscule for adding value to someone else's brand. I've done that for 23 years. And um, sort of, I don't want to do that again. I want to add value to my own brand. I want to add value to people that I believe in their cause. You know what I mean? So I thought, right, if I read business, I left school, didn't do too great. You know, I joined the army. That's not why I joined the army. <clears throat> I joined the army because uh, literally I didn't know what to do with myself. At the time, I'd just finished college. I was doing graphic design and art and, and it was like kind of looking at University options. I was a civvy back then. I've, you know, the military ask very little of you, to be perfectly frank. They ask you not to do drugs and just stick with the law. Right? I didn't struggle with that, you know. But before I was in the military, you know, I used to. I was an eighteen-year-old bloke in college, and as easily led as the next eighteen-year-old bloke. And I used to like going out on weekends and, and getting up to no good. That wouldn't have worked out well going to university for four years. I would have come out with nothing. And so I thought, right, my brother joined the military, and he says. I didn't know nothing about the army. He says, I thought it was like soldier, soldier. You know, I thought everyone was in the same cap badge type of crack. Anyway, my brother goes, uh, join the signals and I'll get like 200 quid. I went, all right. So join the signals for him to go half us. <laughs> 23 years later, I still haven't seen 100 quid like <laughs> tight offs. But he stitches right up. But again, I, I had plenty of opportunity to fall out, you know, <laughs> before now. But I was always enjoying it. But then what happens is we talked about before the, the sort of financial freedoms become less as sort of mortgages, kids, this, that, and the other. So you become kind of, I don't want to say it, but it's the truth. You end up doing something that you used to do for passion, but now you're doing it because the money certainty. It's security, but then there's always that pension payout. And that pension payout, that's about to kick in very soon. <laughs> and that will stay with us. I'm not, I feel bad for those people that won't say that until later on in life. But, that's going to make, it's going to take the pressure off my life for the, you know, for the rest of my life. I still have to get a job, I still have to work. But I needed that financial freedom to allow me to grow my own sort of thing, which is why I'm fortunate enough to be doing what I'm doing with Moff Couture. But, I don't know, just the screensavers just come on. <laughs> that was that moment I was just on about, you know, where you forget what you're on about. So I just heard in my head, do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> it's mate, we've gone for an hour and 20 minutes, mate. Bloody hell. We need, yeah, we need to start wrapping up in a minute. And, um, uh, well, no, you were talking about losing, you were talking about doing something, do, ended up doing something for the money rather than the value. But then, yeah, as in, you, you, you know, you join because you want to join up, serve your country or whatever reason it is, and then you become, you stay in because financial security, job security. That's not a bad thing, though, mate. It's, but as long as you, it's, the military side of things, definitely. Like, if I look back, I probably would have, if I was to go back, 
in, in a different scenario, I would st- I would have stayed in. And quite often I give the advice to people now when they're like, oh, I'm fucking hating it. Da, da, da. Unless you've got something that you are 100% devoted to or going to be devoted to to get out and do, and you know you can walk into that, if there's any area of doubt in your mind about that, don't get out. Stay in. Stay in. Because job security and financial security and what we fail to realize when we're in i think is that you can leave after 22 23 24 years you're probably early for early to mid 40s you've got that you, you, you're just about halfway through your life these days the length of time we live for the pension the pension age you're going to go further and further to the right you've got time for a whole other career in whatever the fuck you want to do and like you alluded to earlier the military is a great place to get freebie qualifications and experience and as well in 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 the same way as you've mentioned about you know you can you know the best time to start start make mistakes in business and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialism is when you're in because you've got a second income right but also what's the stop you going and trying different industries there's nothing it is quite it, you can it is absolutely within the within the realms of possibility that you are serving you're thinking about getting out or maybe you want to go and do for example graphic design it's entirely within the realms of possibility you can go and spend a couple of days at a graphic design place you won't get fucking paid maybe you will get paid if you've got some skills but you're still serving you go and dab your hand in it and do that a few times like your own orchestrated work experience exactly yeah because it's a lot easier to get that kind of thing when you're older than when you're younger but you've got you've, you've got skills there go and try it out it's like the best time to understand to get to understand what civvy street is to, to start learning about civvy street is before you fucking leave and it ain't the ctp you're going to tell you what it's really like you need to go out and experience it yourself you're gagging to say something but i was just no no i was just i'm, I'm totally in agreement with what you're saying hugh and, and the fact is though that's coming from someone that's self-motivated there is a lot of people um that don't think beyond what they're told and and that so the military is fantastic at building your confidence early on, right? It builds your confidence great because you've become part of this. You know, you mentioned that spoke before. That's you, you're imperative, right? So you might have sort of 60 spokes on a wheel, but whoever did the R and D into that wheel know they needed 60 spokes. Yeah, it'll work with 59, but that 60th spoke is important, right? It's as important as any other one, and that's what you become as a Tom when you join the military. You are like if you imagine this cog, right? I'm, I'll talk about a cog because you're on about these different things. I will be super quick here, right? <laughs> right. Well, we're up, we're up, Warren, Warren, he goes on about like sort you of. You fucking uh, love Warren, don't you? Yeah, he's class, mate. He's class, right? <laughs> he, I've just done a piece on uh, dividends, right? Now he doesn't pay dividends, but he invests heavily in every company that pays dividends. He's just got like sort of three hundred. Uh, million from Apple in dividends a year th- this year alone, right? He's he's mint when you think about like sort of business. He is true businessman, and um, but anyway, if you ain't got money to put into stuff, right, you have to look at how else you can create value. So that's where Moth Couture started, right? It had to start somewhere, right? So it was like me sharing my own ideas, my own positive affirmations, right? And what I did it for was to grow a following. So the day came when I did have me bottle lamps and things to sell on me shelves and stuff. I already had an amount of people to look at. The community wasn't that. The community was very organic. It was very genuine reason behind it. But this is where we get to, right? <laughs> that as I started doing them, that was to raise money for the next venture. And the next venture we're already starting now, which is me building a motorbike, an old Triumph motorbike. I've got ridiculous ideas. And if they work... Mate, they'd be super cool. One of them's in the development now, right? And I'm doing it now. Um, but it had to grow like this, so I didn't have money to do the motorbike straight on, right? The money that came in from me bottle openers, I bought new tools. You know, I bought new tools. I upped me tools. So I didn't actually, I didn't go and get me snakeskin shoes and me new skinny jeans or none of this rubbish, right? I bought new tools to make me life easier in making these parts for new orders. As and I had gazebos, rubbish gazebos, like 15 quid from Argos. I was making the stuff in all weather under these gazebos. So in it, winter, I'd go through about four or five gazebos. But then it become, right, I've got to build a workshop so I can work in there, right? Any money that came in then got reinvested into new things, new sort of products. So I haven't seen the value. Moth Couture took us to bloody the south of France on Holder and yet, you know what I mean? Every penny goes back into Moth Couture until the day when it needs to stop and it needs to pay as a wage or on pushing trolleys in the supermarket. But I learn learning business at the moment. There's a few things like business for dummies. Don't call your brand name after the Latin because no one can pronounce it or spell it. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> 
I'm in it now. Bugger it. It's, it's trademarked. It's it's company house. It is what it is now. So I'm just going to have to keep it as it is. But actually, I quite like it. And if people like it, great. They'll learn how to pronounce it. If not, you'll get people like a friend rung us up when I first started, laughing at us. Um, not being nasty. It's just army bants, isn't it? You spell creature wrong, you idiot. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Do you not even speak Latin, you idiot? <laughs> but do you know what I mean? So it's like, you just got to go with it. But then another thing business has said is create a community around your brand. So it's got a buzz. And then you've got your own little feed up on for your brand. I did that before thinking about that. And it's kind of like, I wasn't a business genius or nothing because actually it doesn't even work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one's buying from us. But, you know, it is what it is, isn't it? And, and it's all evolving. And, and like we spoke about before, at this moment, I'm so fortunate to still have my wage and still be enjoying what I'm doing. And as long as I keep on enjoying it, that's, I'm happy. That's, that is the fucking key, mate. That is the, that is the absolute key in anything. I think when you're, uh, oh, man, I don't know, you have to be a, to, to not want to maintain the enjoyment you get from a, whatever you do business-wise. Man, you have to be so focused on money that what are your real pleasures in life that you, you're doing life wrong? <laughs> you're doing it wrong. You're doing life you wrong. Know? And that's not. That's a t shirt, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. You have to be focused on money in some way, shape, or form. And, and especially when you haven't got disposable income. Because, face it, at the moment, most people, working class, they don't have disposable. We don't have it. There is no disposable income. But, um, I know we've probably finished, right? But the <laughs> fact is, during lockdown, when I first, I got my t-shirts, I got my baseball tops, I got everything. I put a video out saying, because I had a lot of people asking for them, and I said I wouldn't. It's not up to me how people choose to spend their money, but I was watching the news in April 2020. So many people being laid off. There's so much in the news about, like, sort of people not getting paid and stuff. I even said I'm not selling it because at the moment, we're talking about lockdown and post. We didn't know how severe COVID was going to be. Right, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if it was going to be the plague. So it was like, right, I'm not going to put a postman's life at risk delivering a T-shirt for you to wear in your own house. That's not going to happen. And there's millions of celebrities cashing in on it because there's loads of people. E-commerce went up 60% during lockdown because people had nothing to do. People that were normally at work earning their living were at home bored, buying shit they probably never even need. And I made this decision, I'm not going to do it. And I did it. <laughs> I'm stupid. I had to stick with what I believed in, you know what I mean, at the time. It's not going to, people aren't going to be like, oh, I'm going to buy one of his t-shirts now, he's a good bloke. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen, so I'll keep myself up. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the website, mate? Uh, so it's www.mothcratura.com. <laughs> you fucking idiot. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Creature with an A before the E. Yeah. The yeah, a. exactly. An, yeah. A after the, an A after the R. That's, that's going to be my sign-off now. Creature, but with an A before the E. Yeah. <laughs> It's on Instagram. Follow it on Instagram because I put posts up all the time about me projects, what I'm up to, and this, that, and the other. And then it is easy to you'll, find. Yeah, you'll see the website um, in the bio there. Awesome. Mate, be a pleasure. Be a pleasure. And Janet, mate, it's a fucking alley brand. I do like, I'm glad Dave Davis uh, introduced me to it and I'm following you on Instagram. I fucking love the shelf and the lamp and the cardboard box that came in. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the fucking stickers, mate. No, mega. Awesome. I'll I'll stick a link in the bio and let's do this again at some point. Cheers, you definitely. Luck. Thank you. Cool.